So welcome back everyone. Um, we're going to do an overview here of the materials that we use for the Yamaha Wave Runner project. And um, I know I touched on all this stuff throughout all the videos, but I just want to bring everything together in one shot and give you a complete list basically of everything that we use. Um, I think what I'll do too is uh, I will uh, write out a list and I'll put it down below um, in the description and uh, that way you know you have a permanent list you don't, you don't go back and listen to me talk over it all the time. Um, so yeah this will put the Yamaha Wave Runner project to bed that will be done and over with and then we can move on. So uh, no real order here whatsoever I don't think so uh, the first thing that we're going to need uh, is alcohol and essentially this is isopropyl alcohol 99.99% as pure as you can get uh, again you don't want to pay for water and you don't want to have any contaminants in it so you're going to need alcohol um, just as a recap you cannot and should not use any solvent uh, acetone anything like that on those uh, FRP hulls and uh, the Nano XL, you know, the same stuff there. Uh, so again, uh, all your cleaning, all your new waxing, everything is going to be done with your alcohol. All your cleanup will be done with your alcohol. Um, don't contaminate your working materials or anything else with anything other than alcohol. Um, with the fairing compound and stuff like that, you may require acetone or some sort of cleaner to clean that up. Just make sure that you know your spreaders and whatnot are wiped down again with alcohol to get rid of any residue of the solvents. Um, okay, so that covers our de-waxing, our cleanup, and everything else. Uh, after that, we get into the repair, and I'll be right back because I forgot a few things. All right, so take two. Um, so after we did our cleanup and we did our prep work and everything else. Um, you saw in the videos I cut out the, uh, the damaged area um, and assessed it as needed basically. And the first, first layup that we did was with our G-Flux. Uh, so again, this is from West System and uh, it's a two-part two epoxy adhesive basically. Uh, it's gonna form a waterproof bond and seal up you know, whatever you're trying to seal. It's called G-Flex because it does cure 100%, but it does remain somewhat flexible or pliable. Um, you can still sand it, work with it, whatever you need to do. Um, but it allows for that little bit of flex in the hulls that you require whenever you know, you're working on a boat, really. Um, you know, uh, boats are constantly under flex, under load. And uh, so you want something that's gonna move, you know, somewhat a little bit. Um, so after we did uh, our G-Flex layup and then we came in, uh, we hit it with 80 grit sandpaper and, uh, you know, roughed it up. Uh, whatever wasn't 100% level, we got in there just with, you know, a little piece of sandpaper and uh, just, you know, lightly scuffed it up to uh, give us a surface to work with to apply more epoxy, basically. So after we were done with the G-Flex, uh, we moved on then to uh, laying up some fiberglass mat and that was just 8 ounce fiberglass tape basically and I had mentioned I'd buy it in <coughs> the pre-cut wind speed basically uh, just for the ease of use and it's easier for me to keep clean and you know if you're going to be doing a lot of it it's totally up to you if you want to buy the big bolts of fiberglass uh, but typically like a bag of pre-cut tape and again, I keep one inch, two inch, three inch, four inch, I think five and six too, uh, all the way up. It makes life a lot easier, less cuts. Um, and again, it keeps everything clean. So we used our EXP system epoxy here. And with this epoxy, again, it's a two part mix. You do need to add hardener to it. And again, you can go with fast, slow, or medium. Um, I was using intermediate that gives me, let's see here, uh, 18 to 20 minutes working time and that's, that's lots. 
And again, you're just mixing in small batches. If you need to go back, you can keep going back. Don't mix up one big batch and have it kick on you and spoil, you know, it just makes a huge mess, right? Try to keep things as simple as possible. Uh, so again, eight ounce fiberglass mat, and then we used our epoxy resin then to go in there and attach that to the hull. Uh, after that, uh, if you look back in the videos end two, we then mixed up an epoxy batch with some quarter inch chopped fibers. And this is from Fastco Epoxies. And again, uh, this was my first time working with this. Uh, I was happy with the product, uh, happy with the company. Um, I was happy I was able to get it. Uh, you know, we got supply chain issues and everything right now. Um, so anyways, quarter inch chopped fibers. And what that was doing, that was giving us a bigger layup, um, adding strength to our epoxy, essentially, and uh, allowing us to fare it in um, with, you know, minimal sanding and everything in the end, right? So after we laid up our, uh, our mat, I came in, I think I hit that with 80 grit again. And then after that, I roughed up the area and that was again with 80 grit. And then we mixed up the batch with a quarter inch and, uh, you know, put that on basically. And uh, after that, then we, because we were so close to where we needed to be at that point, uh, that's where I came in with our total fare. And again, this is a two-step system. Again, it's epoxy. Um, so came in, we did a hot coat uh, there is a video out there just on the hot coating of it, and um, so again, total fair. And this stuff, again, I mentioned, if you can get your hands on it, if you're able to work with this stuff, it's amazing. Uh, pinholes and everything stay down to a minimal. Um, very smooth, lays out very, very well, and you know, excellent sanding capabilities and everything else. So uh, after that was all done. Um, we did do some uh, filling and whatnot. If we jump back here a couple steps, um, you're going to need cabosil, obviously, uh, for thickening up any epoxy that you need to thicken. Again, this is from Fasco. And all these, these three items here, basically, the chop strip, um, the cabosil, and our micro screws, they, they can all be mixed together. And there's no real scientific formula for this. Um, they each have their own sp specific uh, quality that they bring to the, uh, or characteristic, I guess, to the job. And you're free to experiment. Um, really, there's no right or wrong, per se, on, you know, what you can and can't use. This stuff can all be mixed together. Uh, one thing, again, when you're working with Cabosil or the microspheres, uh, respirators, masks, you need to wear this stuff. Uh, this is as light as air. You get any breeze, anything like that. Even you just dumping it out or taking it out with a spoon, uh, there's dust. You need to wear a mask. Um, so anyways, if you're looking at using this stuff or anything, you want some information, again, there are videos out there that I have about working with all this stuff. And again, this is just a recap on the materials that we use. Uh, so I think that covers our fillers and everything else. Uh, once we hopped into the fairing, basically, um, I used all the total fair. I did mix up a thickened batch with the microspheres and did all the underneath uh, repairs, and that worked out actually very, very well. I know when I was laying up in the video, I had said I wasn't sure how this was going to go. I hoped that, that it was going to go well. It went very well. Uh, I would definitely do that again um, and save, save having to go over it with the total fair and everything else. Um, so once that was all done uh, and we were sanding down, again I was using a long board on that and that's mentioned in one of the videos, it's a 4 inch by 22 inch I think long board and 320 grit sandpaper. Uh, this is, you know, terrible strips from 3M and this, you know, hook and loop system right onto uh, the long board and away you go essentially. Uh, not rocket science here. Uh, so 80 grit sandpaper to knock down all your high spots and to rough in, basically. Uh, after you're done with your 80 grit and you got, you know, you're doing any final or fairing, you're getting close, um, bump it up. 
it 80 just removes too much material too fast and if you're not careful um, you just you're laying up more material again and it's just a vicious cycle so it takes a little bit longer uh, but you'll be happy with the finish so again from I went from 80 uh, right up to 320 essentially and 320 took me all the way into the priming uh, once we were at the primer stage and I'm kind of jumping ahead here a little bit you know we jumped up on sandpaper grid again uh, so anyways 320 and 80 is going to be basically all you need until you get into your final work uh, with that being said uh, clean rags if you don't know if your rags are clean if you can't guarantee it and again they have to be clean uh, you can't use old shirts you know like this sweaters whatever else they have to be clean clean rags if you can't do clean rags paper towel it's as simple as that um, you know when when you're working with this you are concerned about you know having any contaminants everything has to be clean that's why we use alcohol we're being as sterile as possible we're using paper towel even the grease and everything off the hands you need to use some sort of latex glove anything like that it's good for you and it helps prevent any issues on your projects that you're working on right um, so that's paper towel um, all your mixing and everything else you're gonna need some sort of measurable cups uh, these are from PPG these are 8 ounce and these are 32 amps those are the two that I use uh, the 8 ounce these are great uh, to be honest if even for the project that I was doing 8 ounce cups I would probably go ahead and get a bunch of these uh, keep your batches small this helps control that and you're able to mix smaller batches and less waste uh, you can come back as many times as you need to and you know mix up more uh, 8 ounce cups get some lids uh, they work awesome and 32 ounce the PPG ones whenever you get into your paint primer or you need to do a big enough layup you're going to need a bigger cup uh, but other than that that's all you need for cups uh, you know a dozen a dozen of these maybe and half a dozen of these you know, uh, should do the job for you for mixing stuff up uh, disposable popsicle sticks don't break the bank on this go to the dollar store or dollar general dollar ammo whatever um, pick up some popsicle sticks in the craft section and go with it uh, nothing fancy if you can get large ones it, it, they work really well when you're doing thick stuff um, you can get just a small little normal popsicle stick sent for doing you know lighter batches or whatever else um, you're gonna need some spreaders we touched on this already again from your local you know auto parts store um, Canadian Tire whoever um, you know they're, they're cheap basically they're really reusable if you like after them and uh, if they're not you know pick, pick up a couple packs for three bucks whatever um, so make sure you have those um, and then before we get into doing our ap after our primer we're doing our base coat and everything else so before you're going to start spraying this with color or whatever else you're going to need tack cloths uh, you know for the project I would be doing you know to wipe down the entire unit one cloth and they're still reusable you're still going to before you do the tack cloth you're still going to wipe everything down with alcohol and uh, make sure it's all clean your tack cloth is like you know the, the two minutes before you're going to spray this thing basically uh, you're going to need a tack cloth and uh, <coughs> we're going to get into the paint and everything here in a second uh, when you do get into the paint uh, you're going to need some strainers uh, whenever you're doing anything with paint essentially you need to strain it stop any chunks uh, debris dust whatever from getting in there you want it to be as perfect as possible right um, so definitely you're going to need some filters uh, so we're going to hop into paint as i mentioned i had showed you in the previous video there are yamaha repair manuals out there for repairing the frp hulls I highly recommend if you're going to do any of, any of this is you get the manual from your local dealer. Uh, they should be able to even email it off to you. It's, uh, it's just something that they have on demand. There might be an admin fee or something like that and I can to totally understand that if there is. Uh, but for whatever that admin fee is going to be for them printing it off or emailing it off to you, 
I highly recommend that you get, you know, the repair manual. And there's repair man. The repair man manual covers everything from your uh, wave runner hulls up to your composite uh, jet boat hulls because they have different hull materials for different uh, units that they build, basically. So you need to know what unit you have, what your hull is. The repair and everything's going to be the same. You're still going to be using the epoxy layout unless you're into fiberglass. And at that point, if you're in fiberglass, you can either go epoxy or you can go um, with, jeez, it's been that long, uh, polyester based or vinyl ester based um, resins, basically. But uh, we haven't touched any of that yet. Uh, everything I've done so far has been on epoxy, and that's what we're going to stay with right now. Uh, whenever you do get your paints and everything else, you should get your material safety data sheet uh, from whoever your paint supplier is going to be. And this is also going to give you uh, your working times, your flash points, and everything else. Um, so, again, it's important to get all the paperwork with the paint and the products that you're going to be using so you know how it all works. Because if something goes wrong, and you're going to pick up the phone and yell at somebody, you want to make sure that you have, you know, all your information down pat because this is exactly what they're going to ask you first because they're not going to take any responsibility. And even whenever they ship everything out, it's on the top of the cans. Like, they're not responsible for anything, and I totally get that. Um, you, you know, the buck's got to stop somewhere, you just can't keep passing along. So at the end, you're responsible for making sure your colors match, you know what material materials you're using and you know how they all work and adhere to each other and you've got to make sure that they're going to work uh, with each other you're not going to have a reaction and you're going to have a failure in your work basically um, so that's about that for getting into it um, so we're going to get into the primer here and again you're you're not always going to have, so I think this is Nason, and this is made by Exalta, and Exalta does a lot of stuff, that's the old DuPont company, blah, 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 uh, but anyways, you need to use a urethane-based primer. Uh, on these Yamaha hulls, it's a urethane paint. Um, you can do, there, there is epoxy primers and everything out there. Um, but because we're going to be finishing with urethane, we're going to use urethane all the way through. Um, that's really important that you're not mixing things in between and everything else that you're using one product start to finish basically. Uh, so urethane primer, uh, again it's a two part, you got the primer, you got your hardener, and get your material safety data sheet, your, um, what you have it there, your, uh, your technical data sheet as well. And it's going to tell you how to use this. Again, this isn't going to be the same across the board. It's going to be a different mix ratio, whether it's going to be 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1, 5 to 1, whatever it is, you need to know what material you're using and use it properly. Um, so again, this is a primer that we used. And I know that none of this stuff here was on any videos because I didn't do any spray videos, you know, for reasons of overspray and whatever else. So anyways, that's the primer that we used. Uh, I hit that, uh, I think the first coat was three separate coats. Again, you just want to apply light coats and uh, let that cure. I had to come back in after uh, the primer highlighted some areas I didn't see. Uh, come back in after and do some spot repairs on some pinholes and whatever else and fare some things in. So after the primer, that's what we used. We're going to pause this here for a minute. I'm going to grab something and then I'm going to explain what I did for some small little pinholes. All right, so I had some small little pinholes that my primer highlighted for me. I could have mixed up a batch of total boat, total fare, and did that. This stuff is great uh, when you do have pinholes and whatever else that I mean, we're talking small pinholes. Um, I couldn't get this into where I wanted to. So basically what I did was I bumped over to the body putty. This is automotive. I know this. It's polyester based. I said at the beginning you can't use polyester based on these hulls. Very true. 
the fact that I am using this in very, very small, and we're talking very small quantities, is not an issue. Um, because we're sealing with a primer, it's a urethane-based primer, this is 100%, okay? This is sealed between essentially two layers. We're spraying it with, pr with primer. We're finding our little areas. We're giving them a quick wipe down, a quick little sand. We're putting in very small, pin, again, pin holes. Uh, so I'm mixing up very small quantities of this, pushing it into the pin holes. This stuff works awesome. Uh, this is by Napa, and um, it's just a polyester based spot putty basically. You can need very, very minimal stuff of this. So this is what I used there. And again, these hulls can be repaired with polyester based materials. The problem with doing large repairs with polyester based materials is the kickoff time is very short. It goes from almost zero degrees or room temperature to, you know, 120 degrees and then come right back down. When you have that quick of a cure, you're pulling all the wax, you're heating that up. And like I said before, there is wax built into these hulls. You're pulling all that out. The chances of your repair failing are, you know, it, it increases huge. Um, so again, this is polyester based. Yes, it does heat up. Again, pinholes, not an issue. So yes, this is okay, perfectly cool, ain't gonna hurt anything. Again, urethane-based paints are being used on vehicles. We're also using this on vehicles. No reaction, we're not worried about it. And we're not worried about this absorbing any moisture. Again, we're doing pinholes, a uh, very small area. And you're sealing it between two layers of prior. So, you know, not an issue there and you know, we're going to move on off that. So that's that. Uh, once we, once I was done with that, I uh, gave those areas a sand down again. I hit it again with another layer of primer. After we're done with our primer, we confirm all our edges and everything, everything looks good. You know, we're going to give this a sand down. So at this point, um, I'm using uh, these pads, basically. They're six inch pads, I think, on an air sander. And these are you know, they're foam, right? And I don't know if you can see that or not, but these are foam back pads. Uh, you want to be able to flex. You don't want to have hard, sharp edges. Now, all you're doing right now is you're taking the orange peel basically off the primer. You're blending the primer into any other areas that you're working on. And you're making it nice and smooth basically at this point. You're just roughing it up, getting it ready for your base coat for your paint. Uh, you're not looking at removing a bunch of primer. Uh, you, you're just coming in here and you're you're blending and roughing up. You want to keep primer on top of all your repair areas and you're just feathering up the edges basically uh, with these discs. So I don't use a lot of these I think for the entire boat. What do I have here? Uh, I use three 500 grit basically. So again we went from 80 grit, we bumped up to 320 grit for fairing everything in and now that we're sending our primer and primer for paint, we're on 500 grit foam backed discs. Uh, these can be expensive. These are Merca pads by Aberlon. Um, I think they're like seven bucks each Canadian, something like that. Um, not cheap, uh, but they work really well. It can be used wet or dry. Um, so that, that's good. Uh, so after we're done this, and we got everything blended in basically, and we're all happy with it, the next thing to do prior to our paint is so we're going to wipe that down right but then we're going to come in and this is maroon colored uh, scotch brake and this will stick this is hook and loop system this will stick to your hook and loop system and all you're going to do with this is you're going to come in here now and you're all feathered in and everything now so now you're just looking to rough up your area prior to paint this is like 360 grit, something like that, uh, what I was told. And you come in with this and you're just doing a quick pass. You're just roughing it up. Uh, you're taking any little pieces, you know, and getting into all your small little areas and just scuffing it up with uh, your maroon scotch brake pad. And scotch brake, you buy them in the little sheets. You take your tool and you, you know, trace it out with a Sharpie or you take your other disc, trace it out, cut it out, 
slap that on, go for broke. Um, very easy, again, we're not re removing material, we're just roughing it up, getting it ready for base coat and a paint. Um, so after all that's done, that gets us past the primer stage. Everything's primed, everything's sealed at that point. Uh, now we're just looking for show. That's, uh, the repair is 100%. Uh, it's all fared in, it's all, you got your angles, everything's looking good. And remember, paint's not gonna hide anything. Uh, paint is paint. It's just an aesthetic thing uh, that seals your work basically and makes it look shiny, you know, nice. Um, it's, if you have imperfections, you're gonna see it. The paint's not gonna cover anything. We're, we're talking mills, and we're not like millimeters, like in terms of liquid mills, and you know, not very thick at all, right? So, uh, what we did was we came in with a base coat, basically, and this was a darkened color, basically, that's very close to what our paint color was. And what this base coat was, was it was sealing off the primer. Um, so this was sealing all our repairs, uh, water's not going to penetrate the base coat, and this is just a one shot, mix it up, spray it on, let it kick, you know, you got a uniform color, and this will also allow you to catch anything prior to your paint. This is just like a quick spray on, let it flash, take a look, and you make your decision at that point. Uh, yeah, we're clear for paint, or, oh, I didn't see that, we need to fix that before moving any further. Uh, so this is your base coat, and you're, we're spraying this, right? So we're using a 3M uh, spray gun, uh, whatever you want to use. The nice thing about the uh, plastic 3M guns is that they're disposable tips, disposable cups. There's almost no mess, no cleanup. Uh, very, very nice system to use. Expensive, uh, but very nice to use. Um, you can buy a cheaper, you know, paint gun from your auto print store, Canadian Tire, what have you, and use that. Uh, but then you gotta clean the gun and everything else, and if you don't clean it up properly, you know, then you need your cleaner and everything else. So, anyways, that's what we use, 3M paint guns. Got any questions about them, let me know, and I will pass along the information. So again, there we go with the base coat. The next thing we did was a paint. And we did three coats of this paint, and this is color matched, so I had uh, Napa, who mixes all my paint, they come in and they do a scan. So before you start your work or whatever else, you need a flat area that's not damaged, and they come in, they scan it for you. Uh, it gets you, you know, as close as possible to whatever color you have, basically. And it does a really good job. You're not really going to notice it, right? Um, so, anyways, this worked out to be um, mag magnetic or gray or something like that. Anyway, it's a little bit of metallic and everything in it. And. Uh, so this is what we use basically a spray on three coats of that um, that used almost this full quart and uh, that got us some good coverage and obviously you're again referring to your technical data sheet you're paying attention to flash times I think we we're 10 to 15 minutes flash time you come back once it basically goes dull you come back you spray again and you just keep going like that um, so there we go so your primer base coat paint and then after your last coat of paint, everything's looking good. Um, we went to a clear coat. And again, this is all your thing based, right? You got to keep it the same. All made by Exalta, by Nason. Um, again, this is under a different name. This says Montana, but we're still made by Exalta. All able to work together. Uh, so this is a urethane basic clear coat. And we came in with three coats of clear, and that used the entire quart of clear. There's just a little bit left in there that hardened up. And that's it. And then you basically just close up shop after it airs out, and you walk away and come back in the morning, and hopefully everything's good. Uh, so, anyways, uh, that covers all of our materials that we use. Um, not much in terms for equipment. I mean, a lot of it was hand sanding. We used a long board. I used a three inch orbital 
standard uh, air powered for some areas. And you saw me use uh, my Fest tool uh, for the, the initial knockdown, uh, an air tool with a couple of burrs, and uh, my six inch air sander basically for doing my final sand for prepping for primer, base coat, etc. So I think that's everything. Uh, turned into a longer again video than I thought it was going to. And I do apologize for it, but again, we want to bring all this information forward basically to give you the best possible outcome. Um, the, the worst thing is to set you up with this is all you need to do. And we leave out, you know, certain steps and whatever else. And that's usually what screws you or cripples you, right? Um, so if you have any questions again, leave them down in the comments and I'll do my best to get back to you. Uh, again, I will make a list of all this stuff. I will put it down in the description and you know, that'll help you guys out. You'll have a basic list. And again, it's whatever that you're able to get your hands on. Uh, depending on where you're located and everything else, you may not be able to get, you know, the FASCO stuff. It might be Jellico International or whoever. Again, that's norm normally what I use is Jellico International. I couldn't get it. Uh, they had no supply and it was all down in the US. This is the only stuff I can get. So again, that's what we're using. Uh, if the EXP system's not available, you know, this is by Jellico International as well. If uh, that's not available, you know, you gotta go to some other company. So be it. Uh, Total Boat makes pretty much everything that you're gonna need. If you're in an area, I know the lower 48 states, um, they can all, they, they ship. And they're just finishing a promo right now, I think anything over $49.99, free ship. So, you know, fill up, stock up, there you go, I'm done. Uh, so, one stop shop, which is nice. Uh, I don't think they have your paints and whatever else. Again, this can all be done by a paint store. Again, I use Napa up here. Uh, whoever you have in your location that, can, that does paint, um, should be able to find them pretty easily. They'll be able to help you out. And if it's a reputable shop or parts store or whatever else, um, if they're mixing paint there, talk to the paint guy to be able to point you in the right direction. Um, any reputable shop will have a knowledgeable person on staff that will be able to help you with that uh, with any questions basically. So I think that's it. Um, that covers everything. Again, any questions, uh, let me know and I'll do my best. But I think with all the videos out there and then this final video do, giving you an overview gives you everything that you're gonna need uh, all the steps you need to perform and it's going to set you up for the best possible um, you know finish project that you can ask for I think. Uh, this is definitely a um, highly skilled repair. Um, you, you, I wouldn't be tackling this if this was like your first goal. Um, there's a lot of information here a lot of having to know how different things react to different things. Um, you know, if you're tackling this on your own for your first shot, uh, not saying it's not doable, but um, be prepared for, you know, accidents, screw ups, what have you. And, uh, you know, just allow yourself some time and a learning curve basically to go back and fix whatever, you know, oops happened. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, materials wise, I think for that job, somewhere to five to seven hundred dollars materials wise, and that includes, you know, your most expensive parts here, your paints and primers and whatever else. Um, if you're buying, you know, quartz and G-Flex for one job, you're not gonna use it all for one job. It's gonna be used, you know, in other applications, same as your alcohol, you're not going to use a full jug, of, for, full four liter jug of alcohol, but you have it for future projects and whatever else. Same as the epoxy, you're not going to use a full thing of epoxy, but this is all basically the stuff that you need to start with, and this will allow you to do more jumps basically. So I think that's everything. Uh, we're getting along here again. So I'm going to shut up, stop talking, and uh, this is going to sum it up for the Wave Rider video. 
we're done over with. Um, any questions, again, on any part of the video, whatever else, uh, message me. And uh, again, I'll do my best to uh, help you out. So thanks for watching. Uh, please hit the subscribe button, um, your notification bell, all those good things. And, um, you know, uh, I appreciate everything there in advance. So I'm going to cut you loose here now. Thanks for watching. I hope that these videos are going to help you out on your project. And we're going to clean all this up and we're getting ready to move on to some more stuff. So we got uh, some jelly coat repair coming up. So stay tuned and we're going to hop into that. Thanks for watching again. Have a great day. So hey, one thing here while I was cleaning up, um, one thing I forgot to mention was time. And that's one thing that we wanted to do here was to keep in the loop on you know, how long these jumps take. Uh, so I keep track of my time as I go through. Uh, so with this, with the deco being installed and everything else, uh, total job time uh, was 42 and a half hours. So whatever your local rate is, um, whoever's doing the repair for you, uh, 42 and a half hours is what it took me. And that went off without really much of an issue. I didn't really have any big issues that I had to go back and, you know, correct or, you know, they're very minimal on, you know, any real issues. So, um, and that's not always the case. Uh, you know, most often than not, when you're doing a job, you know, unexpected things happen and you know that throws your timing way off um, so for myself 42 and a half hours that's from start to finish that's off the trailer back on the trailer basically um, could be a little bit longer I don't really see it being any shorter uh, could be you know um, better equipped shop or you know, if that's something that that's all that one person does all day, they don't have to do anything else. Could go a little quicker. Uh, but 42 and a half, that's, that's right where I quoted basically. I quoted around 40 plus hours. And we, we were, were there because I did a little bit more than even what I was supposed to do. So um, <coughs> anyways, just so you know that, that's how long this project took. So I know if you had all the videos up and everything else, we're talking, geez, I don't know. There's maybe six hours of video out there on all this. Uh, if that, but not everything was filming. And of course, in places where I sped everything up, you know, that, that could have been like an hour or two where they're working, right? Uh, so the one thing you have to remember, um, YouTube's great because you can sit down and in 20 minutes, see a job start to finish. Uh, if you wanted to. I could have done that with this video too um, and edited it out, you know, six hours worth of stuff. Not what we're trying to do here. Um, trying to inform the customer, uh, inform the do-it-yourselfer that jobs take time and time equals cost. And, you know, just trying to educate everyone on how long, you know, these jobs take. And that's one thing that I find that not a lot of channels do. Uh, they fail to put the number of how long it takes to do certain steps and whatever else. And we're not putting a price tag on this because um, everywhere you go is going to be different, right? Uh, hourly rates can change. You know, one guy can be 90 bucks an hour, the next guy can be uh, 150 bucks an hour. Um, again, you get what you pay for, and but, I, I mean, if you're going to pay a guy 40 bucks an hour to do it, he's going to get a $40 an hour job. Um, not saying that person doesn't know what he's doing. Maybe he's doing it at home as a side job or whatever else. And uh, he does it during the day. Uh, there are, you know, circumstances like that. Um, but, again, you want to source out where you're getting your work done, where the reputable shop is. And, I mean, to be honest, when you're calling around or you're checking in on shops that are going to, that, that you're entertaining getting this job done by, um, you know, you might call shops, oh, we can take you next week. Uh, you call the next two shops and, you know, they're two to three weeks or two to three months behind. That's probably the shop you want to have 
do the work for you because they're behind two to three months or two to three weeks, whatever it is, for a reason. I mean, they're busy for a reason. And, uh, you know, that's probably where you want to park your boat. Um, you know, it's not always ideal, especially during our short season up here. Um, but we start working, you know, early on in the season and we go right through Christmas, basically, until it's break time. Um, but that's the other thing that you have to understand, especially right now. Uh, we, we used to run, you know, two weeks behind. That was pretty standard in the, in, in the industry and in our area for uh, many years. Um, ever since COVID, and everybody seems to have bought a boat and everything else. Um, so this is middle of March right now. I've been booking boats since last fall during winterizing season uh, for this season and some stuff over the winter. And we're already two to three months behind. So if you're calling us today, you know, chances are it could be two to three months. Anyways, I didn't turn off the furnace, so this is gonna be the end of the video and I'm gonna attach this, so I don't wanna keep it short. Uh, just a little bit of info for you. I uh, hope this helps, and again, thanks for watching. We'll talk to you later.